Hi, my name is Jordan Head, and I'm a resident engineer with the Advanced Services team at Juniper Networks. Welcome to the NetConf, XML, and XPath Learning Byte. After successfully completing this content, you will have learned the fundamentals of NetConf, how to build operational NetConf RPC requests, the fundamentals of XML, and how to parse XML data with XPath. Why should I even use NetConf and XML? Automation, plain and simple. Applications that rely on screen scraping can break or become unreliable in the right circumstances. CLI output can change, causing you to re-engineer code. CLI output can be cumbersome or inconveniently formatted, leading to unnecessarily complex code. NetConf, XML, and XPath help mitigate these problems. Juno CLI output is actually built directly from the same raw XML data. CLI output formatting may change. Underlying XML rarely does. XML formatting is structured, allowing for easy parsing with XPath expressions. There is support from multiple vendors. Many programming languages support them natively or through reliable third-party libraries. And they work with existing Juniper automation tools, such as PyEasy, JSnappy, Ansible modules, and Onbox scripts. Let's take a look at NetConf. The NetConf configuration protocol provides methods to manage network devices. NetConf is standards-based in RFC 6241. NetConf ensures data delivery and security by using existing protocols, in our case, SSH. NetConf enables automation by using consistent message types and error handling. NetConf is supported across multiple vendors. NetConf over SSH communicates on TCP port 22 or TCP port 830. To enable NetConf on TCP port 22, you would issue the set system services SSH configuration. To enable NetConf on TCP port 830, you would use set system services NetConf SSH. When a NetConf session is initiated, the client and server will negotiate functionality using the hello and capabilities tags. When a NetConf session is established, RPCs, or remote procedure calls, can be sent to make operational or configuration requests using the RPC and RPC reply tags. We're going to focus on the operational aspect in this lesson. If any errors are encountered, NetConf will send messages with the RPC error tag, which will also contain detailed information about the error. Every operational command in Junos has an equivalent RPC. They can be viewed with the pipe display XML RPC modifier. Here we can see the correlated RPC for the show version command is get software information. CLI arguments can also be used to build more specific RPCs. Here we're specifying the FXP 0.0 and terse arguments. Looking at the RPC, we can see the differences reflected. It's also important to consider that Python reserves hyphens for a special purpose, so they must be replaced with underscores when building RPCs to use with PyEZ. The data retrieved from the NetConf RPC is encoded in XML. The XML encoded command output that would be sent in a NetConf RPC reply can be viewed by appending the pipe display XML modifier. Here we can take a look at the previous RPC that we used as an example. To bring it all together, the NetConf RPC reply is how the requested information is transmitted to you, as you can see outlined in purple. The XML encoded data itself is contained within the NetConf RPC reply in blue. So let's dig into XML a little bit more. The extensible markup language, XML, is a simple text-based format representing structured information such as documents, data, configuration, books, etc. XML formats data into element trees. Trees start at a root element and contain child elements, just like the Juno's configuration hierarchy. XML leverages XPath. The XML path language, or XPath, can be used to find information by searching for specific elements, sometimes called nodes, within the XML element tree. Here are some of the XML terms that will help us understand XPath better. First, elements. Everything is considered an element when referring to XML data. The following types are more important for this lesson. Text. Text elements are just that, text that is contained within the element nodes, such as interface names or statistics. A tag element is another way to represent the name of different nodes. Let's look at node relationships. XPath can be absolute or relative. 
That means that you can either search an entire path for what you want, or you can search relative to a different node within the tree. Child elements are anything under the current node. So if we're looking at logical interface as our current node, name, administrative status, operational status, etc. would be child nodes. Sibling elements are anything at the same level as the current node. So if name were our current node, administrative status, operational status, etc. would be sibling elements. Ancestor elements can be anything directly higher than the current node. Ancestors can be more specific as well, such as parents or grandparents. So again, if name were our current node, logical interface would be its parent, and physical interface would be its grandparent, and so on, all of which are ancestors. Descendant elements are any child element under the current node. Like ancestors, there are specific types of descendants, such as children or grandchildren. So if we're looking at logical interfaces, our current node, name or administrative status would be examples of children, and address family name and AE bundle name would be examples of grandchildren. Now let's look at some of the XPath syntax. XPath has a few methods to search for specific items. You can combine these to make your searches even more specific. First, node selection. It's the simplest form of a search and selects nodes based off of a XPath expression. Predicates are used to find nodes with specific values inside. Axes leverage the parent and child sort of relationships to search nodes relative to the current node. And operators, like many other programming languages, are used to compare data within. So things like greater than, less than, equal to. Let's look at a few examples using this OSPF configuration that's represented as XML. Here we have an example of an absolute path search. As you can see, it explicitly walks down each element tree to get to the exact node. This is an example of a relative search. The double slash indicates that we want to look for any name node inside of any interface node. But be careful, the double slash is very greedy. Because the OSPF area ID and interface name both share the same name, we get all of them rather than just the interface name. So far, we've only seen single searches. We can also execute compound searches. These are just multiple valid expressions chained together with pipes. So if we wanted to explicitly look for the area name in OSPF and the area name in OSPF3, we would be able to chain those together and use a compound expression. Let's look at predicates. This is a simple example of a predicate to find the first OSPF area. Notice that all of the child and subchild elements within that area are also selected. Getting a bit more specific, we can search for the interfaces with a hello interval of less than four and select the name of those interfaces. Here we use the double slash to shorten it. And this is probably the most useful sort of predicate search. Here, any 10 gig interfaces in OSPF would have their names selected. And now for axes. Axes are a little bit more complex, but suppose we wanted to find all of the interfaces with a child node that contained interface type. Now, here's operators. We have actually already seen some examples of operators, but here's one more just to cement the idea. Here we're looking for any interface that has a dead interval of exactly four, and then selecting that name. Let's say your manager has asked you to build some automation that would find the operational status of important interfaces. So first we know that opera status is what we want, so let's try and look for all of them and see what we get. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too greedy and it gets the physical and logical interface status. This may not be ideal for our situation. It makes a little bit more sense to just consider the physical interface status. So let's adjust our search and find what we need with an absolute path. Here we walk down the tree, interface information, physical interface, operational status. Now it gets us what we want, but isn't really all that helpful without knowing which interface it's talking about. We have a few options here, but the simple one is to use a compound expression. These are multiple expressions combined using pipes. So if we look at each individual search bolded, we can see that we go for operational status in purple and then interface name in blue. And it does get us what we need. But let's consider how automation can evolve as networks grow and change and look at some of those possibilities. So the old request was to find the operational status of important interfaces, a bit vague. So let's look at the new considerations. 
different interface types, one gig, 10 gig, 100 gig, lag, etc. Thousands of interfaces, it should be able to scale and search quickly. And for this application, let's say we only care about the physical one gig interfaces. So we could phrase our new request as find the operational status of important one gig interfaces only. This must work efficiently on devices with thousands of interfaces of varying types. Okay, so let's get started. We have two new approaches. First, we could build a better XPath expression. You know, can we leverage XPath further to better filter the data? Or could we build a better RPC request? Can we filter the data more effectively before we parse it with XPath? There are obviously many other approaches you could take, but these are just two simple ones you should look at considering when building automation with XPath. So here's a little bit more of a complex XPath expression that uses axes, predicates, and what are called node tests. So what we're saying here is let's search any physical interface containing GE star in the name and any child element with the name or opera status will be displayed. So it shows us everything we want. That's great. Um, maybe a little bit complex for some, but let's take a look at why it works. We shorten the XPath syntax to find all physical interfaces using the double slash rather than the absolute path. We know that one gig interfaces use the GE prefix. That knowledge plus a wildcard search with XPath allows us to only parse one gig interfaces. And finally, we now execute the XPath in a single search rather than a compound one by using axes, node tests, and predicates. But what about the other approach? Build a better RPC. This is probably the simpler one. So again, we know that the GE prefix is used for one gig interfaces only. So if we're searching and retrieving only those interfaces from the router, we know that we're only going to get shown those things. So it first allows us to avoid those complex XPath expressions that everyone may not quite understand yet. It guarantees that the network device will not send us any other interfaces like 10 gig, 100 gig, or lag. And another bonus is it means we're only transferring the information we care about across the network. At scale, this, this matters. And also parsing less is helpful too. So in this content, we learned the fundamentals of NetConf, how to build operational NetConf RPC requests, the fundamentals of XML, and how to parse XML data with XPath. Something else worth mentioning that is if you want to learn more about XML and XPath, you can check out w3schools.com slash XML for great reference guides. This brings us to the end of the Learning Byte. Thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.